All right. All righty. Thank you so much. What an honor to be here this evening. Wow. Even when you hit the record button, I just thought about how far we've come <laughs> from the beginning of this pandemic to now, where, you know, obviously data and technology has really transformed all of our lives. And I've been thinking a lot about this before I do the official Well, Do we need to go back to the office five days a week? We have technology, we have data, we can share data even within an office to enable us to track cases, to track trends. So it's really great to be here on the 10th anniversary of the open data law. And thrilled that Queens is a part of the festivities in New York City's 2020 Open Data Week. I would like to thank the entire team at the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics and the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications for all the work that you do and for keeping New York City at the forefront of tech. Learning new technologies helps our city and communities thrive in more ways than some might realize. Having access in real time to accurate data about your community is extremely important for economic advocacy and accountability reasons. New York City's open data program is an opportunity for all New Yorkers to engage with information that is provided directly from city government agencies and elected official offices. Some will ask why use open data? For example, when a community board hears common neighborhood complaints, needs to decide where to invest funds, recommends a renewal of a license, looks for a list of noise complaints from 311. Actually, I did a lot of work around marijuana arrests and summonses too. Uh, and that's one of the reasons legalization actually happened because we were finally able to get our hands on that data. Search for parking tickets from DOT or look for discretionary funding of previous years from city council members and even borough presidents. If all of that information is not in one place, that is easy to find. That puts them at a disadvantage from the get-go. This is exactly what open data has been trying to combat for the past decade. New York City open data is an invitation for anyone, anytime and anywhere to engage with New York City and its government. Data is more than just about numbers. It's information that can create new opportunities and level the playing field for all New Yorkers. So you all know I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I've directed my staff to identify all the information that we can share from my office on data this year. We will make sure that information ranging from list of appointments made and grants issued by my office to an overview of community board demographics to reports about constituent service requests is all made transparent and accessible to all Queens residents. With that being said, I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us here today and for taking the time to learn about this valuable tool that will help us all create a more equitable New York. And let me just end because I see my community board director on Maricela Cano is on and coming in as borough president. One of the things I ran on when I ran was the need to make sure we were more transparent in the borough president's office. So community boards was one of those prime areas that I really wanted to focus on because there were a lot of challenges around the demographics, the makeup of community boards, attendance. And largely, we were able to shape in our first year 110 new appointments, the most diverse class probably the, the borough president's office has ever had in Queens. Over 70% of women were appointed, 72% of women were appointed last year. Uh, we saw an increase in the LGBTQ appointments, people with disabilities, African Americans, South Asians, Latinos, because primarily the boards did not comprise of enough of the different diverse set of folks that we thought would be reflective uh, of our communities. But the data that Beta and all of you helped us to work through enabled us to have that real conversation and to do that in a real transparent way. So I say that to say that it's not just about the numbers. Data enables us to shape policy. It enables us to look at areas even coming out of the pen, looking at where should we invest dollars, where dollars not heavily invested. And any elected official should be proud at sharing data. If you're doing the right thing, if you're looking at things from an equity lens, if you're transparent, that makes for good government. So I want to thank you all for the work that you've helped us to begin to, in the borough president's office, because this is largely the way we're going to transform Queens, ensuring that there are new voices, ensuring that there's more transparency, which enables us to hold even ourselves accountable, but agencies accountable. And, and I will say the tool that you enabled us to, to work with was really even transformational for council members who've been around for a long time. Going back to last year, uh, as my staff can attest, 
doing our first round of community board appointments, many council members were like, whoa, we never saw this. We were able to actually take those data sets and show them where their shortfalls were in community boards. And they were like, this is a breath of fresh air. We've never seen anything like this. But it also enabled them, although we all don't look alike in Queens, it enabled those council members to also appoint a more diverse set of people, even within their community boards, because we had data to work off of. So I want to thank you uh, and welcome you to Queens if you're not from Queens. I see Maricela is on right now. Maricela, we just got finished meeting with our first round of council members today, where we're able to actually cite data on where our boards and where appointments can be better based on the work of all of you. So I want to thank you because this is going to help inform us even when we're making policy decisions around transportation, food access, affordable housing. You have to have, and if you don't have data, in my opinion, it's not real just having a philosophical conversation. When I go to talk to the mayor or I talk to the governor, as I did last week, I'm able to go and inform largely because I have data that we can cite. And that enables policymakers such as myself to go in and, and lobby and advocate on behalf of the residents in pointed areas because I have the data that you provided. So thank you, thank you, thank you. This is just the beginning of a conversation. It's the beginning of our administration. But we, I've tasked everybody to really work in ensuring that this office is, is data-driven and that the public has access and that we're transparent and which enables us to be held accountable as well. So thank you for having us. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so one of the most important things is to make sure people know how to use that data. So we're really excited about the ambassadors program that we've created uh, in partnership with the Office of Innovation and Technology. We're gonna hand the floor over now to our ambassadors, Laura and Maria. Thank you so much. So just before I get started, just to give a quick intro on myself, my name is Laura Hecklinger. I, as mentioned, am a volunteer open data ambassador through this program. Outside of my volunteer work here, I do data management for the Long Island Railroad, and I'm really excited to be here to share open data with you. Just again to reiterate, the material for this training was co-created by MODA, the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, and Beta NYC. And thanks again to both of these amazing organizations for putting on this week of open data. Today in this program, I'm going to go through the history of open data and how we've gotten to where we are today in New York City with our open data program, and then give you the tools to really access and utilize New York City's open data, and then run through some examples of how you can apply that to maybe some issues in your community or your neighborhood, and really what you can do with that data in your day-to-day -day life. Defining open data um, to be Quite simple, making government data accessible to the public. And because of its connection to data, oftentimes when we hear the phrase open data, we'll be thinking of a more 21st century phenomenon, one that accompanies the growing importance of data in our everyday lives and stems from the increased creation and use of data by governments, both in New York and around the world. In fact, though, we actually have a really long history of open data or of data that goes back a bit further. So better understand how we got to where we are today, we're going to touch on some developments that led to NYC open data. If we go back to the late 19th and early 20th century, this is where we really have the roots of the open data movement, especially in New York City. This movement can be traced back to good government effort during a time that was known as the progressive era of government reform. And these were reforms to fight against corruption that was taking place at the city uh, level. And one early example of this is the city record, uh, which we have an example of on the screen here. This is a publication where we would have like, a central repository for information about city solicitations, public notices, purchases, hiring. Um, and it was just bringing different transactions from the background into a public facing record. So this was... This began in 1873, um, so this is actually pretty far back. And if we jump ahead a few decades in the 1960s, we're starting to see at this point an increased movement again in open information. So at this time, we had what was called FOIA or FOIL, which you may have heard of before. FOIA is our Freedom of Information Legacy or Act. And this was passed at the federal level, but also by state governments. And FOIA made, or FOIL made government information available upon request. So if you knew you had some piece of government data that you were looking for, 
you could go and reach out and ask for it. And if that information exists and we were able to, and the government was able to share it publicly, that information would be given to you. So this was definitely a step forward, but you still had to know what you were looking for and make that effort to reach out and request that data. So we still have a bit to grow to get to where we were today. The next step forward was in 1993, New York City released a public data directory. So this is building off of FOIA. This made a subset of the information that was available for from through FOIL, information that was data more accessible by providing a listing of what data agencies have. So with FOIL, you had to come up with an idea of what you were looking for and request it. So in contrast with this data directory would give you a list of what information might be available. And we have an example here on the screen. You'll be able to see all the different agencies. You now have a better sense of what information might be out there to request. Uh -oh. So we're a little bit closer. The biggest breakthrough, in my opinion, that we're really going to have comes in 2012. This was when the New York City Open Data Law was assigned. And this really changes, changes, the, picture, changes the landscape a bit. At this point, our law is now saying that our data should be public by default. So while many cities have open data as a policy or executive order, New York City's law guarantees that the public will have access to this information in perpetuity. So regardless of administration. So if we think back to where we came from with FOIL, um, you had to know what you were looking for. You had to make that effort to figure out what the data was, reach out, and then that information would be given back to you. We moved forward again. We now have this directory. And this takes it to that final step. We now have this data portal where all of our data is now accessible and it's made public. Um, and so now you don't have to go out and request it, you just have to go and search for it. So step one is knowing that this data is out there. Now you just have to go and access it. And so when I'm talking about open data in all of in all of these instances, a question I'll get a lot is what does that mean? What data are we talking about? What am I referring to? And I think this graphic is a really good example of laying out different data points that might exist on this open data portal. So if you're thinking about just walking down the street, you're in a way, interacting with many points of data all around you. So in this, we can see different things such as front and center, we have a recycling bin. That could be a point in a data set on through our Department of Sanitation, how much waste is collected, where do we have recycling bins throughout the city, what neighborhoods have recycling collection, how frequently. And if we scale back, you start to get a, a larger sense of what other points of data we might have, such as Department of Building data, DOT, it's endless. And there's this screenshot comes from a video that helps visualize this a bit more, which we can share a link for that as well if you're interested. All right. So we're going to go into what data we can find. Now we have like our creative ideas going on what in regards to what data might be on this site. Let's first refine the idea of data a little bit more. So the data on the portal, first and foremost, needs to be machine readable. So our data needs to be structured in a format that a computer can use. So on this screen, we have an image. In this case, this wouldn't be on the open data portal since it's an image and the computer is going to have some trouble with this. But we might see some points um, of data on the portal, which we could use to create our own map, for example. So normally when we're thinking of what data we might have, we're thinking stuff that can be structured in a table, such as rows and columns, or in a really standardized computer format. Another key component is that the data on the portal is not going to be private or confidential. The goal of this portal is not to go out and dox people. We're really just trying to make information open and accessible while maintaining privacy residents as well. And there might be some exceptions. Here we have a screenshot of a data set on citywide payroll. So there might be some instances or data sets that do include personal information, but all this has been vetted before it's been added to the site and it's been deemed that there's a reason we would have this information out out there that so it's not going to be violating anybody's um, rights by having it on the site all right and to give just another oh, a little taking a step back with the site we have now so the portal that houses all of nyc's open data as of this year contains over 3,000 data sets made up of billions of rows of data and it's managed by moda uh, the mayor's office of data analytics and the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Um, and collectively, they're referred to as the NYC Open Data Team. So every piece of data that's 
getting loaded to this portal is coming through this team, making sure it's formatted in a good way and getting updated correctly. And it's made possible by a network of 100 open data coordinators who are spread out throughout different government agencies. So every city agency, office, or commission, including elected officials, has an open data coordinator. And it's their responsibility to work with the open data team to identify, structure, document, publish, update, and share their agency's open data sets. So overall, it's still a relatively new program. So the data we're going to see on the portal is still growing. You'll see new data sets being added frequently as these open data coordinators continue to collect and publish data. All right, so let's get into it. So now we have a little history and an overview of the data that we're going to find on our data portal. Um, I'm going to go through how to navigate the site and how to actually pull data from it. So the link you're going to want to remember is down here, nyc.gov slash open data. I believe it's in the chat as well. This is our open data portal. And once you go to the site, um, you're going to have a landing page and you'll have a search bar. That's the first thing you'll see. So if there's a specific data set or agency, et cetera, that you're looking for, you can just type that in here and you'll start to get some results. But if you're maybe not sure what you want to look for yet, I'd recommend going to the top of the page. You'll see this data button. This will give you an overview of the more than 3,000 data sets that exist on the open data portal. In this example, I'm clicking through to that page. This is going to take you to a nice overview of all the data we can get. The way I like to view it is like my seamless homepage. Maybe I, I know I want some data for a project, but I don't really know where to start. I'll get some ideas here. So maybe I want to find the newest data sets that are added to the portal. I would check this new data set link. Maybe what's most popular today, see what other people are looking at. Or maybe I want to just navigate by a different category, either environment or business. Or you can look at different agencies. So maybe I know I want, I'm looking for 311 today or the fire department. That's me where I'm just going to head to directly. And these are just going to highlight that quickly. All right. So if you're not really sure where to start, it's always fun to explore. Every time I've been on there, I've found a new data set I never would have even imagined existed had I not played around a bit. I think one example that I learned about at the School of Data this past weekend was a data set of rats in New York City and buildings that have been inspected for rats recently. It's very interesting, horrifying, but definitely recommend just poking around there and seeing what you find. So we're gonna run through a quick example of pulling up some data sets. In this example, I'm gonna look for some 311 data. So I'm back on the original landing page and I'm gonna do a search for 311. If you're not familiar with them, 311 is a government resource for assistance and general info outside of emergency situations. So. If it's an emergency, we'd be thinking 911 for non-emergency, 311 is the place to go. And they're a really great example because they're open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, and in over 175 languages. And they work with roughly 3,600 government services. So they're collecting a lot of data. Anytime somebody puts in, calls them up, they're collecting data on that call. So once I search for 311 on the landing page, I'm given a bunch of results, and we're going to investigate this first one, 311 service requests from 2010 to present. So I'm just going to click once, once you get your results, you can just click the title there, and it's going to take you to this little about page. If you're like me, sometimes you just want to get to the data and you skip through things. Really important, I would never skip this page. This gives you all of the information about the data set, and it's actually really important to always start here and read it first, even if you're in a rush, just to make sure you're a little bit about the data you're working with and making sure it's the correct data before you jump into any larger project or analysis. So when we click this page, so when I click this page, at the bottom, we'll see what's in the data set. So this is gonna tell us an overview of the size of the data set. So we'll see immediately it has 27.5 million rows of data. So like I mentioned, they're collecting a lot of information. It's made up of 41 columns. And it's telling us here that each row in the data set is a 311 service request. That means any request that comes in means is showing up in this table as a that request. So that's a really good starting point. And we can also see here the last date that the data set was updated. I'm going to jump ahead quickly. The next thing you'll also see is the update frequency, which says daily. So this screenshot was from back in January. If I pulled up a live, if I went onto the website right now, most likely the updated date would be a little bit more recent since it's telling me here this is updated daily. 
but I'd always check those two points. So the updated date and the update frequency, just to make sure you the time frame from the data set that you're looking at, because maybe there might be a discrepancy there. That's just good to know when you're looking at your data later on. And then you can also see here how many times this data set has been viewed and downloaded. So this is really exciting to see it's been viewed and downloaded hundreds of thousands of times, which is great. That means people are accessing this data. And the last thing in this about section that we're going to look at is this little link here. This is for our data dictionary. So this is one other thing that we always want to look at before jumping into our data. Once I click that, it's going to bring me here. So your data dictionary is just a rundown of what your data means, even more than what we just talked about. So this is telling us the every single column that's in our data set. So as we saw before, there's over 40 columns, I think 41. And then it's going to tell us what each column means. So it'll tell you the date. One of them, for example, is created date. That means that was the date that the service request was. And you should always go through this because it's easy to make assumptions about what a column name might mean, what you think it means, and it's possible to be wrong. So it's always a good idea to just go through this. Column names also sometimes are a little cryptic. So this is a really good place to just figure out what we're looking at. And they'll also give you some expected values. So this third column, they'll that'll further give you some more information on what the data should look like. So that might be useful in identifying any outliers, for example. And when you're looking at this, say you go through this data dictionary and maybe it's not clear, you can always go onto the site. There is a contact us help page. So if you have any questions, you can always go there to get some clarification if needed. It's better to really be sure what, what you're looking at rather than make assumptions and come to incorrect conclusions later on. So I'm going to go back to my about page and we're going to do what we've all been waiting for and actually look at this data. So at the top of the page, we have this view data button. I'm going to click that and we're going to see this table with our 25 million rows of data. And you can see that at the bottom, you'll see the count of rows that are available to you. And we'll see, like we learned in our about page, we have 41 columns and more than 27 million rows. So this is a lot of data, most likely more than what you'd be interested in looking at one time. At least I know if I was looking at this, my computer would, would run very slowly. So if I was looking at this data set, I'd want to break it down a little bit first and just pull out some more relevant information just to narrow down the data. So what we're going to do is we're going to filter our data set. So you'll see on the right hand side, we have a few options of things we can do with our data set. And the second one is filter. So this allows us to narrow down the data that we're looking at. Right now, I'm going to add a filter. I'm going to change community board is, and I'm going to set it to Queens community board one. So this is telling the data set only show me records if they exist in Queens QB1. And once that filter is applied, you'll see that the count of requests drop from 27 million to 546,000. So we've made it, we made a dent. We're getting a little bit smaller here. I'm going to go ahead and just add a few more filters though, because that's still more data than I'm looking to work with in this example. So I'm going to add a second filter on the created date. So in this case, we'll do created date is after and set the date to January 1st. And then we'll add an agency. So we're setting it to agency is DFCNY, so the Department of Sanitation. And this will narrow our records down to 289 results. So this is a lot more manageable and maybe more specific to the information I'm looking for. So once I have my data, once I've narrowed it down, there's a few options for what we can do with it. So the first one we have here, very simple, is just exporting it. So at the top of the page, you'll see export. And we'll have a bunch of different formats that you can choose from, such as CSV, JSON, XML. So if you're familiar with these data types, you can pick which one best suits your needs and just download that data directly um, to your computer and work with it from there. So maybe you want to just download it, put your put the information in Excel and do some work there. That's up to you. You'll also see under export that you can pull some APIs. So if that's something you're used to working with, that is another option you get here. One thing that's really great is if you're downloading that data, that means um, you'll want some system on your end to you know work with and analyze and visualize the data set. One really great tool that exists on the open data portal is a visualization tool. So earlier we saw, we we're looking at the view data page. You can also, rather than viewing the table directly, we can hop into a visualization um, tool. 
So I'm going to click this button and we're brought into a visualization tool, which allows us to manipulate and visualize the data as we like. And this is really powerful. I've worked with a lot of data visualization tools and they're usually not, there are a lot that are free and great, but a lot of really good ones are also cost a lot of money. And this is a really great free and public resource. So I can't highlight enough how great it is to check it out. So in this example, we're working with the same data set. We have that 311 data. And we're going to start by choosing how we want to visualize it. And you'll see we have a few options at the top of the page from bar charts and scatter plots. We have a globe. I'm going to select this one and make a pie chart. So we have a little pie. Since the data is not filtered yet, we're going to add in the filters here. So you'll see on the right, we have a created date filter applied. So this is all 311 records that were created from are created on March 21st, 2021. And then we're going to aggregate the data. So on the left hand side, you'll see that this data is aggregated by borough. And then we're looking at a measure of count of rows. So each slice of the pie represents a count of service requests by borough on that date of March 21st. And this was all just done directly on the portal. I didn't have to export the data. It's all right here. The another really great visualization op option they give you is making a map. So at the top of the page, before we had the pie selected, this time we're going to select the little globe. Again, we're going to apply a filter. So in this case, we're going to look at service requests that came in this case yesterday. And in front of us, we now have a map which puts a point at every service request that was created on that date. So you can get a sense of where those visualizations lie spatially. All right. The last one we can look at quickly is just a bar. Again, selected the visualization type at the top of the page. We applied filters for agency and the created date. And then we've aggregated the records by complaint type. So each complaint type will have a count of how many requests we got for it. So we can see on this day, the top request reason was for street conditions. So maybe that's something we'd want to look into further and see what's happening with the streets on March 21st or March 1st in this case. All right. So again, all of those tools are available for you in the Open Data Portal page. They're really cool. You can really do a lot with them and recommend checking it out. If you ever need some inspiration or just want to check out what other people are doing with Open Data, you can also check out the Open Data Project Gallery. This is the link for it at the top of the page, nyc.gov slash open data slash projects. You'll see a whole gallery of projects that other people have made using that same data that we were just looking at. Um, so you can get a lot of really, see a lot of really interesting and insightful projects here. And if you are into making these yourself and ever make one, you can submit it to be featured on the site. That way others have access to it as well. Another resource I'd recommend is NYC Maps. Similar to the projects that we just looked at, this, these maps are created by city agencies to make their, their data more accessible to the public. So you can explore these and see other visualizations that exist all using open data. All right. And we have 13 minutes left, so I'm going to go through quickly this section on answering questions and solving problems with open data. And again, if you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we'll check them out. So now that we have learned a bit about NYC Open Data as a program and how to get started using it by searching for data and filtering it and creating these visualizations, I want to think a little bit more about reasons why people might be working with open data in the first place. So sometimes working with open data could be purely exploratory. You might just want to see what's going on in your city or in your neighborhood. I like doing that myself. I think it's really fun to look at all the cool maps that people have made. But oftentimes people are working with open data because they have a specific problem they want to inform or a question they want to answer through the data. And the reason for having these questions could either come from work or maybe just from personal interest or just your day-to-day -day life in your community. So let's go into thinking about how we can use open data to answer questions and solve some problems. So we're going to start with a scenario. So our first step is going to be to define the problem. So thinking about what is a problem that you are looking to solve. So let's imagine in this case, I might be working for a government agency and we want to create a program to provide support for restaurants. And my agency wants to distribute small grants and loans to restaurants. So if I was the person in charge of developing the program and deciding which 
restaurants should receive funding, I might want to use NYC open data to inform that decision. So step one, define the problem. So step two, maybe I'm not sure which data I want to use yet. So I'm going to start by going onto the NYC open data portal and seeing what data they have that might be useful in my project. So back on our NYC open data portal, we had that search bar before. So maybe some terms I could search would be business and restaurant just to see if any data sets come up that are related to these two topics. And when I search that, we get a lot of responses. So on the right hand side, you'll see some examples. One of them is a data set of legally operating businesses. Another is biannual pedestrian counts. So maybe you can see what foot traffic is like, like near certain restaurants. There's a lot of data sets there. So these are just some examples. So now, once I've identified some data sets that might be helpful in determining which restaurant should receive funding, the next step is to frame specific questions that get at the problem that can be answered using those data sets. So for example, in this case, on the right-hand side, we have some questions that might be useful, such as which restaurants have received a grade A rate restaurant inspection in the last year. Maybe we want to give funding to only those that have performed really well, or maybe the opposite. Maybe we want to give funding to those that aren't that have lower grades to help them get up to a higher level. And so we have a few other questions here that we could ask. All right. So once we've asked those questions, we can then probe a data sets data dict oh sorry. We can look more at the data sets we have and see how we can use those data sets to answer those questions. Again, a great place to start is going to be our data dictionary. Maybe some of those data sets we thought were useful, but once we dive into the data dictionary, the data set might be about something different. So I would start here to make sure the two actually line up. Again, if you're, you have any questions about the data set that you're looking at, maybe the dictionary is not very thorough. This was that contact page I mentioned earlier back on the open data portal site. There's a contact us button. You can submit any questions here and a member of the open data team will get back to you. So this is always a really great place to start. So I'm going to go through. Um, if we're going back to our steps of what we're looking at, the next thing we're going to want to do is really frame specific questions that get at the problem. So let's go back to that example I mentioned earlier, which restaurants have received grade A inspection ratings in the last year. So if I'm looking at this data set, New York City restaurant inspection results, once I look through my data dictionary and I look at what the data set uh, includes, I'll see here that this could be really helpful. It has a grade column, so it'll tell us what grade and what score these restaurants have. And so from here, once I've framed my question and I've found the data, now I can go ahead and conduct analysis that answers the questions and summarizes the results using tables or charts. So this again could all be done in that open data portal using the visualization tool. So here we can see we have restaurant compliance and how these restaurants are doing in terms of their current inspections, whether they've skipped them, if they're compliant or not. So maybe this will help break down potential restaurants to work with in this program. If we go back to that example of finding restaurants with a grade A, we can also make a visualization by aggregating restaurants by the grade they received. And this one's kind of interesting. When we do that, you'll see that the majority of restaurants actually have a no value assigned to their grade. So this might take us back a step. Maybe we need to do some more investigation and ask why are there so many restaurants that have no grade assigned and figure that out before we move on with our analysis. So say we've gone back, we've done a bit more research, we've used that data to make some, to get some insight. Now that we're informed by the results, we can use all that information to really make a data-driven decision or provide stakeholders with recommendations. And that's that's the end of that whole process. Now, rather than just picking restaurants with no data behind them, we've made an informed decision and hopefully selected a restaurant based on this data and can have a large impact by doing so. All right. And my last section is how to get involved. I just want to highlight this again on the Open Data Portal site. We have a contact us button. All these questions get fielded by the open data team and you'll be getting help from the person or the agency that manages the data you're looking at. So rather than guessing, I always recommend going here and seeing, submitting your questions here. That way you can get a really reliable response. And this is also a good page if there's maybe a data set you would like to look at, but you're not seeing it on the portal, you can request that here as well. And that agency that you're requesting it through will get back to you and say, 
either, hey, yeah, we can add this here's when we hope to add it by, or they'll give you an explanation for why it can't be added publicly. So if you have any ideas about new data sets that you think would be useful, this is a great place to go for that as well. And then just as mentioned before, the Open Data Project Gallery and that Maps page are both really great resources to see how others are using open data. And you can use them as well. A lot of them allow you to filter and aggregate data using these projects as well, which is really neat.